Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I'm excited to be talking to Patrick Hall, the Senior Director of Product at HCO.A. Patrick has a background in math and he has done a MS in the field of analytics. In this episode, we talk all about Patrick's journey into machine learning, into machine learning interpretability broadly speaking and his journey at h2o.ai how his work has evolved over the years at h2 this is an exclusive first i believe where we talk a lot about machine learning interpretability model debugging model fairness in this interview the caveats and uh, the future of this field including research and applied research broadly speaking how are these ideas implemented inside of h2o.ai's products and how can a person working in this field even bring them to their pipelines patrick shares many amazing insights along all of these lines so i'm really excited to be releasing this interview a quick note to the non native english speaking audience if you're watching it on youtube or if you're not watching it it on youtube please go to youtube and enable the subtitles this episode will have proper checked english subtitles that will be manually reuploaded so that you can have a better experience watching it or if you'd like to read the interview in a few days from the video and audio release this will also be released on h2o.ai's blog uh, blog page so stay tuned if you'd like to check that out instead for now here's my interview with patrick hall all about machine learning machine learning interpretability and the future of the field please enjoy the show hi everyone today i am really excited to be talking to one of the pioneers if i may of the field of machine learning interpretability patrick hall senior product director at h2o h2o.ai thank you so much patrick for joining me on the chai time data science podcast uh you you're welcome it's my pleasure to be here thanks uh today you're working as the senior product uh, senior sorry senior director of product at h2o and i i was researching about your background i found a few themes around software research applied research and leadership in your background can you tell us where did machine learning start to come into this picture and how did these uh, themes so to speak connect uh, with machine learning okay okay so um i have always been interested in math even as a little kid um and when i when i got, and i did lots of things you know i i did lots of things in in my education that had nothing to do with math but i sort of settled on um being a math major in my in my last years of undergrad and um i was always on the applied math side i was good at solving equations but I was horrible at proofs i mean just not not good <laughs> uh, and uh and so you know being on the applied side of math i ended up in computational chemistry graduate school because i had almost gotten a i had almost gotten a chemistry degree as an undergraduate okay um and and so i was pursuing a phd in in physical chemistry and uh you know in in modern science that, that's probably one of the the places where big data is the most sort of real right these instruments and simulations generate a ton of data and i got super into analyzing the data and that was kind of my thing in the research group and uh and then you know just 
by different and sort of varied circumstances. I didn't finish the chemistry PhD and I ended up um, going into software engineering and, and I'll, I'll tie this up really nicely. <laughs> it, it turns out that in chemistry, in physical chemistry or computational chemistry, we, we move atoms around in a molecule. Typically there's other things that happen, but, it, until the molecule or molecular system reaches a low energy state. Mm -hmm. And in machine learning, you move model parameters around or you look for model rules until the model uh, gets into a low error state. And so it turns out the math in, in physical chemistry or computational chemistry is really, really similar to the math in machine learning. And I uh, was just kind of uh, just, just ready to go for machine learning, I guess. You were sort of secretly still preparing yourself for the math of machine learning, if I may. Yeah, but I, I didn't know that's what I certainly didn't know that's what I was doing. This was all, <laughs> it's all it, it really was a, a happy accident in the beginning. Uh, I feel really lucky that I ended up here because I really enjoy machine learning. And, um, I, you know, I didn't even know it was an option for a career when I was younger. When, when did you discover your passion for machine learning? When did you decide you want to take up a career in this field, so to speak? I'm not sure. You know, like I said, I, I really, you know, I was really much more into the data analysis um, than the chemistry part and, and computational chemistry. And maybe that was sort of the first, um, first, first sort of insight I got. Um, and then I don't, I don't know. It, it just, it just always made, you know, I think I just have a sort of intuitive understanding for machine learning for whatever reason, I think, cause of, cause like I said, getting the molecule into the low, energy state is very similar to getting the model into the low error state and um and and so maybe i didn't really feel like i had a passion for it at first i just kind of had a knack for it and then um now that we've gotten into this idea of interpretable machine learning or ethical machine learning or responsible machine learning um i do feel sort of more personally passionate about that and and that you know that's been a really cool thing over over the last couple of years. Awesome. Coming to your current job, you're working at S2O.A. Can you tell us what mm -hmm. task are you working on? What does a day in your life currently look like? Um, so I spend a lot of time traveling, which is not you know I, I don't actually love to travel. Um, you know, business business travel is fun at first, and then and then not fun. <laughs> Uh, but I, do, I spend a lot of time traveling and sort of talking to customers and other um, researchers or, or sort of commentators in, in the field or, or people at think tanks. And, um, and I, I do some product management. I, I'm certainly not a traditional product manager. Um, and and really, I think it's really important to understand that the, the engineers on the, on the team, they they do almost all of the work. I mean, I, I, I write papers and I sort of interface with the customers and, and, and occasionally help them translate requests and things like this. But, but it's really the engineers on, on the team that are doing all the work. I'm, you know, I, I, I just kind of help guide it from like 30,000 feet. So, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. You're also uh, an adjunct professor at George Washington U mm -hmm. University. Can you tell us mm -hmm. how do you manage all of these things together? And how do you detect if any one of your student is cheating on their homework with driverless? Oh, I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I, I have lots of ways to detect if they're cheating. <laughs> and it's funny, I didn't at first because I didn't, I didn't think that people cheated. I didn't look how naive I was. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I necessarily do a good job balancing all these things. Um, and honestly, I've had to take a break from teaching. I probably haven't taught for the last two semesters, but I do really hope I can get back to it. Um, and, and, and actually I would be fine with my students using driverless AI. Um, <laughs> I've been, I've been playing this mean joke on them, you know, the last, ever since driverless AI has been in existence where I sort of teach the whole, um, introduction to data mining class, you know, 14 16 classes in a semester or whatever it is. And then on the last day I show them driverless AI and like, <laughs> that's how it does feature engineering and it does, uh, and it builds models and, and it does cross validation. And 
um, you know, hyperparameter tuning and all this stuff. And, and so, you know, I think that one thing I try to get the students to, to understand is the importance and sort of common, you know, how, how AutoML has become so common and, and really this idea that, um, I, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it, but I think it is important for the students to be aware of, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that's necessarily 100% best way to do machine learning in all cases, but um, it's definitely something that people who are entering the field need to be aware of. There's a lot of automation of, of machine learning processes. I believe that's why even if, if I may speak for S2, we are an advocate of a human in the loop of auto ML. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Is, is that a bit? Oh, I think that's absolutely necessary today. I don't, I don't, we're not, um, we're not anywhere near generalized strong AI. Uh, and you're not on the side of robot overlords whenever they will come. Um, I'm no, I, I don't think we have to worry about that in our <laughs> lifetime. So I don't, I don't think I have to pick a side today. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think that for sort of low risk, um, activities and I'm going to pick on, you know, ad placement or something like this for, you know, Maybe, maybe it's confined to use AutoML, but, but for things that are going to really impact people's lives, credit lending, employment, things in criminal justice. Um, and, and I mean, there's just a surprising number of ways that machine learning can be used that could negatively impact people's lives. And I think in all of those cases, it's really imperative to have, to have a human in the loop uh, today. I, I just, you know, I, I think that I, I'm becoming a big proponent of this idea of model debugging, which is just sort of glorified model diagnostics and, and just torturing machine learning models. And every time I really debug a model, I just, it's shocking how wrong and simple that, you know, they are. So, so I, you know, my, my experience has been um, that, that the models are, are very fallible and, uh, and, and we need to be careful and responsible with them. Definitely. We'll uh, talk a little bit more about this in a bit, but uh, lingering on to your career in teaching, so to speak, mm -hmm. you were also involved earlier. I think you still are at meetup groups in H2 or even with teaching. Did you always enjoy teaching? I believe you also authored a book uh, with Navdeep at H2. Do you enjoy this? Yeah, yeah, I did. And that was like, I remember um, when I was in chemistry graduate school, you know, the, the, there was a push, you know, a certain like an informal push. And I think a lot of people in science graduate school have experienced this, like, do not, you know, just just give the absolute minimum time to your to your teaching, you know, your graduate teaching assistantship and um, and, you know, focus on research. And I always enjoyed teaching and I never felt right about sort of um, shortchanging my students and not preparing for class and things like this. Now, I'm not saying I'm always prepared for class. I wish I was, but <laughs> I'm not always. But, um, you know, I, I've just always enjoyed teaching and, and think it's just fundamentally important, right? I mean, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for good teachers along the way. And, um, and I, I think most people, would, if they look back, would, would recognize that, that, you know, their professional career was sort of profoundly affected by a teacher back in back in the past somewhere so yeah i think um teaching is just really Im important and i do happen to enjoy it so um so yeah yeah what are your thoughts on teaching at university versus a person like me who likes to pick up online courses who maybe doesn't have the privilege of having a faculty like you um i guess what what do you mean do i think one is better than the other or how should we use? I think you said it right. You know, I mean, it's, it's, if you have time and money to go to school, like that's, that's really a privilege. Um, and I've certainly had to do some, some online learning myself and, and, you know, self-taught many things along the way too. So, so I certainly understand both sides of that coin. Okay. Now coming to your journey at H2O, even I believe you joined before driverless AI was even introduced, was even created. Mm -hmm. How has your overview of the product and work evolved over these years? Um, I remember the first, I, I used to work at SAS, you know, which is a, sort of the largest analytics company. Um, and I remember the first time someone um, 
from the Netherlands, actually, at SAS, showed me H2O. And we have been working really, really hard on our neural network at, at SAS. And, um, and then someone showed me, you know, the H2O neural network, which was just incredibly fast. And, uh, and I was just blown away, right? So that my very first experience with H2O, was, and it was probably H2O2, I'm not, I'm not sure, okay. um, was, you know, open source H2O2, I think, and seeing how fast the neural network was and just being blown away. And then, um, then I, I went to H2O World in 2015 and, and was really impressed by their sort of focus on Kaggle and their focus on the, the open source community and the data science community. Um, and then I think it, it was December, maybe a year later, I actually joined the company and, and the main product was open source H203 and which I was, which I'm still blown away by. I, I think that's just one of the most phenomenal um, Definitely. Pieces, pieces of software ever released. And, um, and so the, the idea was that the, the, interpretability or the, the explanation stuff um, would just be part of H203. That, that was sort of the original idea just because there was no other product vehicle. And, and we started working on it. And um, you know, I, I think it just, it just made sense to tie it into driverless AI, right? AutoML can, can feel even more black box than, than one machine learning model, right? Or, or just training <laughs> one machine learning model by hand. And so, you know, I think the need for some explanation of how, how the model was working was, was just great. And we had been working on stuff for this anyway. And, and so I think it was just kind of natural that, that it happened. And, and now, the, now things are kind of going back the other way where ideas that were sort of, um, pursued in driverless AI are now, are now ending up in open source H2O, which I love that also. So, um, but, but yeah, I, I think it was just natural. The, the original plan was to go into H2O3, but that's just cause that was all there is. Um, and then, you know, explanation so visual, right. And, and so it just made a lot of sense to get it into the, the product was a GUI, the product that needed more explanation, that, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, uh, you've been at S2O for much longer than me. Can you give us an inside view of uh, the maker philosophy, the makers going to make philosophy, as we call it? Uh, what's it all about? Well, I think it's very, the, to me, the unique thing about H2O is it's a very human company. Um, it, you know, it, it's a company with a soul, which is, which is good. Um, it's, you know, it's not easy to be at a startup necessarily. Um, but, but, you know, I think the people that interact with H2O on the customer side, most of them would agree that, that, you know, it's a company that brings a lot of sort of human excitement and human investment into the product and the work that we do. And I think um, certainly the, the maker culture is, is important and we wouldn't be where we were without it. And just the freedom to, you know, I've never had more, more sort of creative freedom at a, at a job to just, just pursue the, what I thought were the best ideas. And, um, and yeah, I, but, but, you know, there is a downside to this, which is just, there's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of fog of war. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, just miscommunications because everyone is so creative and, and doing what they want to do. And, and, and so far we've survived and sort of struck a balance between, between very, being very human oriented and, and maker oriented and, and somehow running a business. It's not, it's certainly not easier or pretty sometimes, but um, you know, we've, we've been successful thus far and it's a really, uh, really unique place. That's for sure. That's for sure. That's yeah. for sure. A really unique uh, company. I think that's one thing that people usually miss out is engineering also involves a lot of creativity. It's not a science field that you just sit down, code, whatever you're supposed to. Even rival SAI, I think, wouldn't have come to the picture if it wasn't for our maker culture. Yeah, oh, that's certainly. I mean, and uh, it, it, rival SAI was just an idea that came out of a um, whiteboard 
you know, kind of brainstorming session. Like I, and, and Kaggle, it came out of Kaggle. Um, you know, I, I, I have mixed feelings about Kaggle, but like I said, when, when, um, you know, back in 2015, I was just so blown away by H2O's focus on Kaggle. And I thought, you know, I, I, I think at that time it, it was brilliant. Um, and, and I, I make my students do Kaggle and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't like this idea that, um, you know, my model has an AUC of 0.8899 and your model has a, you know, AUC of 0.8888 and my model's better. I mean, that's, <laughs> really, that's not how things work. But, uh, you know, I, I think there, there's a lot of good things about Kaggle and, and driverless AI sort of came out of uh, this, this focus on Kaggle culture. So uh, it's, yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff going on at H2O. Definitely. Now, uh, you mentioned you found your passion for uh, model explainability, machine learning interpretability. Why was this important to you as a field? Like you were saying, is it not, is Kaggle not good enough? The Kaggle situation where you're just looking to get the best state of the art model out there. Why, yeah, why do we yeah. need to? Uh, so, you know, I guess because they got tired of me at SAS headquarters in North Carolina, they, they were sending me all around the world. And uh, what I was seeing is, and, you know, and, and SAS deserves an, a ton of respect, right? SAS did everything before everybody else in this field. You know, they were doing deep learning in 2000s, you know, just, just you know, they deserve a ton of respect. And, and you know, I learned so much from the people there. Um, so I make some kind of flippant comments, but they're just, I'm just kidding around. Uh, so yeah, they, they have customers all over the world and they sent me all around the world and, and because they've been doing machine learning for so long, right. They, they had a track record of sort of what works in machine learning and what doesn't. And at that time, you know, say 2014 before, before Lime, um, you know, machine learning models were basically seen as black boxes. Yep. And, and so it was just like, well, you can't use machine learning model in a scenario where, um, you know, it, there needs to be explainability or interpretability or transparency into how the model works. And then moreover, the machine learning models are very um, complex, so it's hard to deploy them. So, so back in that, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, machine learning projects would fail either because they were too complex to be explained to business partners, or they were too complex to be deployed. And I saw you know, I, I, SAS actually had a pretty good solution on the deployment side. H2O has a good solution on the deployment side. And so I saw that deployment um, problem being getting solved, um, at least to a, a large extent. I think Docker has really helped with the deployment problem and um, virtual environments, all these things, you know, and, and that's really an engineering problem. And I'm not a good engineer. I'm a bad engineer. <laughs> I like the code. I'm just not good at it. Um, and so, and so, you know, because of this experience I had, I focused on, and, and my background, I focused on, well, how do we solve this explainability problem of, of machine learning? Because that's one reason why these projects are failing. And, um, and yeah, that, that's how I got into it. I got into it at sort of this business need, right? Um, yep. In the United States, Credit lenders have to give uh, four reasons, I believe, why they're turning you down for credit and how do they do that with a machine learning model. That was just the original problem that, that kind of intrigued me. And, um, you know, obviously it's it ballooned into something much broader than that now, which is good. I mean, I, I, um, I'm glad that, that, you know, it's, it's taken this more human turn instead of just focusing on, um, you know, what what. Uh, just a small sort of subset of of the market, that kind of thing. Definitely. What's the, if you could give us an overview of the field right now, because many people still think that machine learning is this black box where you know nothing about things go in, output comes out and you have no control. What's the current state where is MLI uh, ready to use? What are its promising areas right now? Yeah, I, I think that this idea that machine learning is a complete back black box is, is dead. Um, I'd say for, for tabular data, we can go even farther than that. For tabular data, there's no accuracy interpretability trade-off anymore, or at least that trade-off has been sort of significantly diluted. 
Um, and I was, I was just showing uh, Shri, our, our CEO, yesterday some results we had using a fully transparent neural network architecture. It beat um, three other models, including a, a standard neural network and a standard gradient boosting machine. So we're, we're talking about on tabular data, I can have a model that's both more accurate than a traditional linear model, more accurate than other machine learning models, and still uh, completely interpretable. So I think that, you know, and I'm, I'm not the first person to bring this up. Like a lot of, all the credit should go to Cynthia Rudin and Rich Corona and, and other, you know, real scientists um, who, who have, have really devoted significant time and effort to this over, over the past 10 or, or longer years. Yep. Um, so, so we can make very strong statements for tabular data. There's just no need to use a black box model at all. I mean, you can, obviously, there's no laws against it yet, um, you can use a black box model, but you don't, you shouldn't, it's just, it, you know, there, there are accurate and interpretable models for tabular data. I think for unstructured data, images and text, there, there are some really good sort of post hoc explanation techniques. Um, you know, meaning I train a black box model and then I'm able to get some insight, some summarization of different mechanisms or predictions of the model. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and I do expect and, and, you know, Professor Rudin at Duke is working on this, um, you know, fully interpretable variants of, of deep learning or augmenting or changing deep learning architecture so that they're more interpretable even for unstructured data. So I, I think that's coming. I, I think it's just maybe not even harder, just people didn't even think it was possible. So they weren't focusing on it, something like that. What industries do you think is this ready to apply? Are we ready to bring this into banking industries, medical? Oh yeah, I mean, ba banking is is the no brainer. I actually, I'd say all industries are the no brainer. That that maybe I've just become, you know, too. Maybe I live inside my own world too much. But <laughs> I just I've never been in a business scenario where it was like, would you like a black box that you can't explain or debug or understand, or would you like a um, model that's just as accurate that uh, you can debug and understand and explain to people. And I just, um, the, ri the, the risk associated with black box machine learning are when as compared to more transparent or, or sort of explainable types of machine learning are just, just too high. Why, why would you do that? Why, why would any company do that? So, uh, yeah, I, I certainly think it's, it's ready for, for prime time. And, um, and, and I mean, I, I work most closely right now with financial services customers and it's certainly being used in financial services. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying definitively that it's being used for credit scoring, even though I suspect that it is, but it is being used uh, throughout the, um, throughout different verticals in financial services. Okay. Talking about industries, even H2O, even though we provide auto ML products, broadly speaking is, a huge proponent of uh, MLI. Where does MLI even come into the picture? Because auto ML is supposed to replace the human, uh, if I may. So why is MLI important in this picture? Well, I think it's like, it's fine to replace the human for hyperparameter tuning or model selection or something like this. It's, or, or it can be fine, right? People, people aren't good at certain tasks and computers aren't good at certain tasks. And, and there's no reason why you know, the, the certain, we can't help each other out with our weaknesses, um, where, you know, it, explaining a gradient boosting machine or constraining a gradient boosting machine to make it more interpretable, um, you know, that you still have to do hyperparameter searches. You still have to, you know, you know, do model selection. So, so I think that's fine. It, it's really about once you have the model, is that model transparent or can it be explainable? And, and so I think I see AutoML as just, just doing that model selection step, right? You know, I could try these different hypothesis algorithms, linear models, neural networks, tree-based models. Um, and then once I, you know, I know which hypothesis model or architecture I want to select that now, you know, it has to be tuned. And, and you know, I think that that part of it's, there's, there's no issue with that in my mind for AutoML. And if it's, if it's done correctly, you know, it's very likely better than people. People get bored and can't pay attention and, and forget to do little thing. You know, cross-validation is very difficult, right? Validation yep. schemes are very difficult to get right. And, and so I think that's, that's a perfect example of if I have an AutoML routine that, that always does very careful cross-validation, 
um, you know, that, that's a great reason to use AutoML. Is there a downside to this uh, transparency as well? Do we always need to create simpler yeah. models? Yes. Okay. Um, there's something in cybersecurity, and I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but there's this idea of the transparency paradox, um, where it's like uh, a system can be so simple that that sort of it can't be, its mechanisms can't be questioned. Um, and so, you know, if someone's manipulated it or it can be so complex that, that you just count on, on no one would understand how to manipulate it. And, and I'm probably butchering this AI, uh, this, you know, transparency paradox, but I think um, it, it does turn out that, that, you know, in some ways, the same idea, at least this idea of just more data is not always better, applies in explainable machine learning. So if there's all these ways to hack machine learning models, and I'm not, I'm not saying this happens very often yet, I think it will happen in the future. Um, and explainable machine learning makes that easier. Explainable machine learning tools are often, the are often tools used in the actual hacking, or stealing of machine learning model and data, training data of machine learning models. And then um, also when I provide explanations with a prediction or other information about the model, it just makes it easier to steal, which, me, which, which typically makes it, the, the big deal there is one, people are getting access to your proprietary business logic and that's bad. But two, what's worse is that, you know, I, at least I know how to reconstruct training data from, from just a machine learning endpoint. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, but um, you know, the, you can really compromise very sensitive training data, which, which will now get you in lots of trouble. Um, and, and it should be the case. So, so yeah, there, there is certainly a downside to explainable AI. There's very, interesting paper recently talking about how sort of expl explanation methods that are based on sampling can be hacked to, and made to say anything that you want. Right. So, so yeah, there, there is certainly a downside and it's basically just that, that all data are, you know, sort of has some risk associated with it. And when I do explanations, I'm sort of generating more data that I, that I have to be careful about. And, and if I'm not, then I'm just sort of, creating uh, privacy prop, you know, potential privacy problems for my, myself and my customers. Who should be cognizant of all of these downsides? Like most, most probably a ML engineer just looks at creating a model and putting it into production. Uh, should those also be cognizant of these downsides, even think of making it more interpretable or uh, do you have any guidelines there? Well, I wish everyone would think about it. Um, you know, the, the analogy I use is it, machine learning is just, and it could fail again, right? Machine learning's failed and, and, and sort of just, it's failed to scale to meet the needs of, of the general economy on several occasions. It, it seems like it's gonna work this time, but we don't know for sure yet. Um, and the, you know, so, so we have this powerful technology that's sort of being used in different ways across the economy and, and different, you know, government organizations and, and other places. Um, and so I wish instead, you know, people think like I can just do machine learning, right? Or would you think like I can just do aviation or I can just do nuclear? Um, <laughs> you, or it's just a powerful technology. It can be used, you know, and this, this is very cliche. It's the title of a book from the president of Microsoft, Tools and Weapons. Um, you know, just any powerful technology can be used as a tool or a weapon and, and machine learning is no different. Yep. And um, yeah, people should think about that. Probably everyone involved with, with machine learning should think about that. Um, and I do, you, you can see governments around the world starting to take notice. Um, I've noticed, you know, that the UK and Singapore have, have put out very uh, detailed, at least sort of proposed guidance for the use of artificial intelligence. The Trump administration um, recently released uh, proposed guidance for US regulatory agencies. Um, I noticed in, in, in India, there was a, there was a state that, that wanted to do some regulations around facial rec use of facial recognition technology, which I think is really smart. So I, I do think people are starting to take notice and I think um, that, that governments are starting to get involved and, and that's probably a good thing. You know, obviously there's going to be unintended consequences and regulation slows down innovation, 
But um, like I said, it's just a powerful technology like airplanes or like nuclear power or, or nuclear in general. And it just needs to be sort of handled with care and, and regulated and, and people who are working with it should, should you know, bear that in mind in, in most cases. One of my favorite quotes is when machine learning models fail, they fail silently. And since we already have uh, almost perfect guidelines for debugging software, but we have literally no defined paths for debugging machine learning models. Uh, can you give Hey, I wrote a medium post about it. that has like 28 <laughs> claps or something. Don't say there's nothing. Um, that will definitely be linked. But uh, if you can also speak about it in this interview uh, for anyone who hasn't read it and will read it after going through the description. Well, and, and I should, I should give a plug to my um, uh, good buddy, Andrew Burt. Uh, we did, he helped me um, kind of downsize that piece and make it more suitable for uh, a, a broader audience. And there's also something on O'Reilly Radar that we just got out in late December about model debugging too. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I think model debugging, the looking for bugs part uh, falls into roughly four buckets in my opinion. So there's residual analysis. Um, sensitivity analysis being the second bucket, um, benchmark models. I think it's really important, you know, like I have a working model and, and this is in Kaggle, you know, they, or it used to be when I used to do Kaggle, um, you know, they always have a benchmark that you can try and work off of, um, and, and compare your more complex model to, I think, so I think benchmark models are, are a really important part of finding bugs, right? Why is, why is my linear model getting this right, but my machine learning model getting it wrong? Uh, and then the sort of white hat or red team hacking that I was, you know, the hacking that I was talking about, I think, you know, ba basically we want to try to find, um, fairness bugs or, or discrimination. We want to find um, security vulnerabilities and, and privacy harms, and we want to try to find inaccuracies. And so I think between um, residual analysis, and I would include a lot of the, the standard um, group fairness test in, in residual analysis, because you're oftentimes looking at errors across different demographic groups. Um, so residual analysis, which may or may not include sort of fairness testing, um, sensitivity analysis, where we kind of perturb the data and see how the model uh, reacts, um, comparisons to benchmark models, and then essentially trying to hack your own machine learning model. I would say those are, those are four good ways to, to, look for, to look for bugs. And then there's lots of ways to fix the bugs if, if you find them. Um, you know, a lot of the fixes are simple, just get more data or, you know, try, try, try different hyperparameters or something like this. Um, but, but, you know, I think there are some really innovative ideas in model debugging, such as model editing. Uh, and and it, I'm not sure all models are editable, but, but I think many models are. And, and again, that, that idea has kind of been brought to the fore by people at Microsoft Research, including Rich Caruana with this, these GA2M or EBM models um, where, where it's an additive model. And so each, each input kind of gets a complex spline and I look at the way that spline is behaving and if I don't like it, I can just change the form of the spline manually. And, and so that would be an example of, of model editing. I think model assertions which, which I think are just business rules. As far as I can tell, I think people in the, that have been in the predictive modeling world forever would just say, oh, those are business rules. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about um, this idea that I can uh, just try to correct a machine learning problem as it's happening, right? Why, um, the example I always give is, is um, prepayment on your credit card. Let's say, you know, for whatever reason, you're gonna be out of the country for three months, and so you make a large prepayment on your credit card, um, and then in the interim, you're missing payments, and so the, the machine learning model might say, oh, they've missed three payments in a row, you know, they're, they're gonna default, uh, but you need to have a business rule there to, or a assertion to check for, to check for prepayment. And, and so I think, you know, the, these ideas of, there's lots of ways to fix your machine learning models, read on O'Reilly, read on Medium, uh, the, the two kind of, um, innovative ones that, that I've heard of are model assertions and, and model editing. Okay. 
lingering on to that, uh, how do we think about model fairness and uh, model biases? Because again, uh, these might be blind spots to the person who's uh, even created or just checking the model. Yeah, I, so I'm not, and I get asked to talk about fairness and machine learning and, and a lot, and I'm really not an expert in it, but I'll, I'll you know, I'll try. Um, and so, yeah, so anytime you're, you're, you're working with data about people that even if it doesn't have demographic information in it, that it, the demographic information is probably encoded somehow in the data. Right. And so even if I'm not using a gender column or a race column or something like this, that information could still be encoded in my data. Um, the, so, so I think that if you're working with data and, and models that involve people, then, then you really do have sort of a professional obligation to do at least some basic uh, discrimination testing. And, and the, the safest way, you know, I, I think the safest, most conservative way is, is there, there are these tests for discrimination that have been around for decades, okay? And, and someone smart just wrote, wrote a paper called 50 Years of Test on Fairness, Lessons for Machine Learning. So like everything else, it, you know, there, there's nothing new under the sun. So, so there's these ideas and legal precedents around um, fairness and in, in sort of testing or employment tests or um, even credit lending that, that have been around a long time. And, and they're sort of well established, at least in terms of legal precedent. And I think that, that people can use those. And so you can Google things like adverse impact ratio or standardized mean difference or marginal effects or shortfall. Um, these tests you can do on the back of a napkin essentially. And, and so I, I think people have a real obligation to do that if they're working with data and models about people. Um, and if you find discrimination, the, the safest thing to do, and this is actually a place where machine learning is, is great as, as compared to linear models, yep. uh, the, probably there's a machine learning model out there for your data set that's just as accurate that doesn't have the same kind of discrimination characteristics. So, you know, machine learning, we have this prob problem, the multiplicity of good models, that kind of becomes a, a solution to, to fairness in machine learning when if I do detect um, discrimination in my predictions, um, there's probably another model out there that's just as good and, and hopefully has better discrimination characteristics. Now, um, you know, that, all, that statement needs a huge amount of caveats. You know, the, the standard group fairness testing, I mean, I think people have written tons of papers about why those aren't um, super desirable in, in all scenarios. There, there's lots of new ways to get rid of bias in models um, or discrimination in models. Um, and, and, you know, I, so I, don't, I, you know, we can go a lot of different directions in this conversation, but, but you know, that, the statement that I, I just made, you know, has some caveats to go with it. But, but in general, I think that the testing is, is fairly simple and then just using that as a model selection criteria is something that all data scientists should probably do if they're working on data about people. Uh, zooming back on back on that a bit, someone who's even mm -hmm. creating these tools, uh, is it possible that they themselves might introduce some biases? Having yeah, blind spots? Of, of course, of course. So, um, you know, and I, I don't, it's very difficult, or I, I don't know, you know, I've had difficulty in my professional life pulling this off. But um, anytime you're working on a serious project, you know, say like making a machine learning tool or, or making a machine learning product at a large organization, um, it's good to have lots of different kinds of people involved. Um, and whether we're talking about gender or ethnicity or different intellectual backgrounds, I mean, it, it just the more kind of people you have involved, the less blind spots you have. And I think that's sort of a piece of common sense advice that's in all these um, write-ups about how to avoid discrimination in machine learning is getting other people, you know, different kinds of people involved in the creation of, of machine learning products. And I certainly think that's true. Um, one thing I'll call out is this idea of sort of um, a colonization, soft colonization of, of social sciences by tech, right? So, so I see a lot of ads and commercials and stuff for, for sort of psychology apps. And, and I always wonder, 
was there actually a psychologist involved, right? Or did the engineers just read a blog about psychology <laughs> and busy coding? So, so I think, you know, I, of course I want people of different races and genders involved in, in, in machine learning projects, but I think it's a, a, a specific thing that get, doesn't get called out there is it's probably really important to have attorneys, ethicists, social scientists, like, it's important to have this, this diverse sort of intellectual background, especially when you're doing a machine learning project that's going to affect people's lives. Um, and no data scientist that I know is, is qualified to act as an ethicist or a sociologist or a lawyer. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of like to call out that aspect of the, of this, of the situation. I think this, that's also where democratizing AI comes into the picture, putting AI mm -hmm. in the hands of everyone so that they are aware of all of the caveats that you mentioned and what it's capable of, what it's also capable of in the negative sense. Yeah, 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 certainly. And right, it, I think it just goes back to this almost cliche idea of tools and weapons, right? It's, <laughs> it can just be used for good and bad. And, and I think we're, you know, I, I, I don't think people... I think maybe two years people weren't um, as familiar with this idea. And I certainly wasn't as familiar with this idea. I, I don't, you know, I get, you know, I'm lucky to work with probably some of the best practitioners in the world. So most of the people I'm interacting with are, are pretty aware of this. And especially in financial services, it's been regu A lot of things of this has been regulated by the U S government for decades. And, and I think that, that just many of the, those lessons, model documentation, um, adverse action notices, bias testing, or discrimination testing. The, these things have been done in financial services for decades, uh, and and just porting them over to any use of machine learning is probably a good idea. Now, coming to the future of the field, I know you are also involved in research, not just applied research. Why is this also important to you, working on research papers and putting a push in this direction? I don't know. I guess this is just because I really just enjoy machine learning. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, it's a side product. <laughs> I don't know. It, it doesn't actually, last year it was not a side project. Um, it, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's a good question. I mean, like I was saying, you know, I, I was just so pleased to see, and, and hopefully this does get published, but if it, if ours doesn't get published, someone else's already has been. You know, we, we did this interesting um, comparison, and, and I would, this is not fundamental research, I would call this very applied research, but, mm -hmm. you know, where we were comparing interpretable or constrained machine learning models to, um, to more standard machine learning models and got excellent results from the constrained machine learning models. We were able to do discrimination testing on the constrained models and the unconstrained models and, and get into a little bit of the differences there. Um, we were able to build these like, you know, sort of a complex uh, visual, probably too complex. I don't know why we always try to make things complex. It's, I do that. Um, I'm guilty of that. Um, <laughs> you know, visualizations of how the models are working. So, yeah, I, I'm just, um, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of problems left to solve in machine learning. Let's say that. Let's say that. And I'm, I'm just very interested in, in trying to solve the ones that I have expertise about. Talking about the future of the field, also mm -hmm. any uh, other research ideas that you are really excited about in this field that have recently come out? Well, I just think, um, so I used to work on deep learning and I kind of gave it up like 2012, 2014, because I, I just felt like it was a really computationally expensive Easter egg hunt, you know, in, in the end. And, um, and, and hard to explain, right? Very, at that time, there was no grad cam or, or, you know, yep. state latency maps or, or, you know, gradient based feature attribution that for whatever reason, you know, that just didn't exist yet or we weren't aware of it. And um, yeah, so, so it was just this kind of, um, you know, I'll never forget, you know, the first time I trained an autoencoder on the MNIST data and saw it make its own um, clusters and then like sort of running damaged digits back through this autoencoder and seeing fixed digits come out the top of it. You know, that was just a very, um, like almost visceral experience for me, like being like, wow, this, this thing really learned something. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and so I really fell in love with deep learning. And then, like I said, just, just for sort of practical reasons, let it go. Um, you know, I, I'll, people hate me for saying stuff like this, but we saw it, uh, when we, we were working on deep learning for text and, um, I think the deep learning model was about 0.1% more accurate than the linear model and took 20,000 times longer to train. <laughs> so, you know, it's just that 0.1% accuracy just isn't worth it at that point. And, um, which is so still we, true in some cases, even in, yeah, yeah. Years. And, and deep learning is still a very computationally expensive, uh, Easter egg hunt. But I, I think that, um, you know, like in the paper that I was just referring to, um, we had these great results from a, from a nearly completely transparent neural network architecture called a explainable neural network that was kind of um, released originally, I think, by by Wells Fargo. Um, and and then I so I'm I'm really interested to sort of keep pushing that um, keep pushing that technology. So this idea of of, of interpretable deep learning is really appealing to me I, I think I, I don't think people do this anymore but I spent a lot of times a few years ago just going around um, telling people not to do convolutional neural networks on tabular data because you know they there's no local structure in the data and that's what convolution needs to be successful and so I don't I don't think people do that now um, and I think there are network ar architectures that that could exploit um, structure or or patterns or attributes of tabular data i'm not going to say that what they are on this podcast but i do i do think that that the future of interpretable deep learning is probably pretty bright um so so i'm really into this idea of interpretable deep learning for tabular data that that might actually finally be more accurate than gradient boosting machines so that's what we showed in this paper actually that the xnn actually in some cases beat all the gradient boosting machines which that's that's a big deal because going back to the early 2000s when Rich Caruana um, did kind of an empirical study of a lot of different machine learning algorithms that gradient boosting trees were, were or gradient boosted trees or stumps were always at the top. And, and so, um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting idea to me is, is sort of interpretable deep learning for structured data. Awesome. Uh, this has been a very insightful interview about this field. Uh, my final question to you, actually two questions would be what okay. basic best advice would you have for someone just starting in the field and someone who's also curious about learning MLI? So I think if, if you're just starting in the field, you have to, um, you have to balance this, the sort of, let's say like the pure sort of curiosity and, and fun of, of deep learning on GPUs on, on, for, for computer vision problems. Right. Um, you know, you kind of have to build, balance this curiosity of, of the state of the art, which is very good, right? Like I, yep. H2O isn't, isn't where it is because people weren't interested in state of the art things, right? Um, so, so you have to balance your interest in the state of the art with, with making things actually work in the real world. And if you want to be really successful, then you, then you have to know how to make state of the art things actually work in the real world. And I guess that's, that's what H2O is, is really good at. Um, and so, so yeah, sort of balancing those two things. Um, and, and, and again, I, people should be curious in the state of the art and people should spend time on, on sort of just, just sort of the pure joy of GPUs and Python and, and Kaggle or whatever. Uh, but, but then, you know, I think, and unless you're going to be a, a, a you know, a pure machine learning researcher, and there's not many of those jobs out there. Uh, you got to know how to make this stuff work in, in the real world. And then of course the best researchers make things work in the real world too. So, so I think that's, that's my, you know, some bit of advice I can give and hopefully not, you know, hopefully that's okay. Um, if you're interested in interpretability or, um, then I, you should, I think you should just go to interpretable models, right? Just go look at um, the Microsoft interpret project or look at my GitHub, look at, you know, monotonic gradient boosting machines or explainable boosting machines. Um, look at all of Cynthia Rudin's code and paper, uh, code and papers. I, I, I just think, you know, that I, I think in 2020, which is crazy to say, um, you know, we can make accurate interpretable models. I, I think people are pretty, swept up in this idea of post hoc explanation. I was originally too. 
but I think we can just do better than that now. So I think, you know, if, if you're starting from scratch, why not just start the right way and start teaching yourself these, these accurate and interpretable models that are available in open source software. Um, and, and yeah, and, and I think you have to think about it holistically, right? Like we want interpretable models. We want to be able to summarize what they did for any one decision, probably in terms of post hoc explanation. We want to test them for bias. Uh, we want to, we want to debug them. So, so I think, you know, also keeping in mind that, that it's holistic, right? It's not just explanations and interpretability, or it's not just fairness. It's, it's all of these things and security. Awesome. Uh, I'd also mention your book, uh, again, which will be linked in the description okay, of this okay. podcast. Mm -hmm. Booklet, ebook. It's not a real book. Come on. <laughs> Along um, with, uh, on, on H2O's GitHub, we have a MLI, uh, I think it's called MLI resources. Uh, yeah. Repository. Yeah. That's a decent place to look. Um, yeah, there, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet. You know, you know how the internet is. There's a lot of stuff out there and, and some of it's good and some of it's bad. Uh, but, but yeah, I think, um, Good, good places to look are, are, are hopefully my GitHub. Um, hopefully, you know, the, it's called my, the Microsoft interpret project. I think maybe now it's called interpret ML slash interpret on, on GitHub. Okay. Um, Professor Rudin at Duke. Uh, and, and there's just a ton of other, Samir Singh has done an incredible amounts of work, you know, original author of, of Lime and and then you know he now works on explanations for for text models, uh, so so I don't I don't even I shouldn't I don't deserve to be spoken about in the same sentence as those people but but you know I I think those would all be good names to to Google if you want to learn this stuff. Awesome. Before we conclude the interview, what would be the best platforms to follow you? We'll have these linked again in the description of this episode. Uh, I mean, I'm on, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. I don't, I don't do that much medium. Um, actually, so I put like maybe the first thing I ever put on medium at the end of last year. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn is super lame. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I, maybe that just means I'm super lame, but that does tend to be the place where I talk to people the most. I'd love to talk to people on Twitter. No one seems to want to talk to me there, but, okay. um, you know, I think so LinkedIn seems to be the place where people find me the most, but I'm, I'm around, I'm around on the internet saying, saying things that I'll regret saying in, in a few years. Okay. Please audience help us change the Twitter matter. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining me on this episode and for all of your amazing contributions and also insights in this interview. Oh, no, my, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.